to discuss pathways to what uh, was described as resilient, sustainable and inclusive growth in uh, South Asia. I am happy to note that the conference proceedings will be anchored by research findings and policy recommendations of the book titled South Asia's Path to Resilient Growth. In the current international setting, global trade and growth outlook appear quite uninspiring and policies have to be conducted amidst a whirlwind of uncertainty. At such critical times, conferences of this nature can help us better understand the evolving scenarios and policy trade-offs, which are not easy in the current uh, times. In my address today, I propose to briefly cover some of my thoughts on South Asia's current macroeconomic challenges and uh, policy priorities. Looking back into history, the South Asian region has been a key hub of ideas regions in the world. The average growth rate in the region was accelerated, has accelerated from 3% in the 1970s to about 7% in the latest decade, that is in the pre-pandemic uh, period. Consequently, per capita income levels have risen alongside notable progress on key development parameters. As per the estimates of the IMF, South Asia contributes nearly 15% to global growth led by India and Bangladesh. The region also receives one-fifth of total remittance flows in the world. The South Asian region has grown responding to formidable global challenges in the past. Following the food crisis of the 1960s, with which all of us are familiar, the region successfully implemented the Green Revolution. And that brought about a huge uh, change in this region in terms of achieving self-sufficiency in many parts of this region. And uh, the earlier dependence on imports from other countries was considerably reduced. After the oil shocks of the 1970s, so that was in the 60s, and then subsequently after the oil shocks of the 1970s, immigration from South Asia to West Asia became one of the largest market-driven labor flows. This in turn led to a significant increase in remittance flows into the region. The Asian financial crisis of 1997 impacted the South Asian countries in terms of surges in capital outflows and exchange market pressures. Over the years, as a crisis prevention strategy, the South Asian countries prioritized sound macroeconomic policies and embraced financial sector reforms focusing on competition, prudential regulation, enhanced transparency, audit and accounting standards. These measures helped in preserving macro stability while sustaining integration of domestic economies with the global economy. In recent years, multiple shocks, in particular the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine have dampened the economic prospects of the South Asian region as in other parts of the world. Some of the countries in the region have also been contending with ramifications of unsustainable debt and climate change induced events. Consequently, they have been seeking recourse to the IMF's financing facilities. Notwithstanding these challenges, as per the World Economic Outlook database of October 22, which was released uh, by the IMF. India, Bangladesh and Maldives would be among the fastest growing economies in the world in 2022 and 2023. According to the Asian Development Bank's December 2022 outlook, the South, Ash South Asian region's GDP is projected to grow at 6.5% in 2022 and 6.3% in 2023. The World Bank estimates that regional cooperation could be a win-win situation for all countries in all countries of the region. For example, 
intra regional trade is currently only one fifth of its potential that is intra regional trade in the south asian region is only one fifth of its potential uh, for, and also this implies that the annual shortfall this has been calculated by the world bank this implies the annual shortfall to be in the region of about 44 billion us dollars the world bank assessment also suggests that a common electricity market for bangladesh bhutan india and nepal can yield savings of about us dollar 17 billion in capital costs Investment in transport and logistics could also help reduce the cost of container shipments in South Asia. According to a study by the IMF, which was conducted in 2019, on South Asia, more than 150 million people will enter the South Asian labor force by 2030. The dependency ratio is expected to continue ebbing for almost uh, two decades, indicating the strong demographic dividend of the uh, you know, dividend the region is set to benefit from. Now, with these positive, uh, you know, with this kind of uh, positive factors, the point is there are critical challenges which I think Antoinette has very rightly, you know, she has captured some of them very quickly. And these are the policy challenges which the entire South Asian region faces. And these challenges, as you know, have been accentuated because of the impact of the COVID 19. The spillovers from uh, the war in Ukraine, the spillovers from globalization of inflation, the spillovers from financial market tightening that's happening all over the world due to almost a synchronized and simultaneous tightening of uh, monetary policies in most of the countries. Now, in these circumstances, I would now like to focus on some of the desirable policy priorities for the South Asian region, and I have identified six such policy priorities. The first one, the first policy priority for the South Asian region is obviously taming inflation. Multiple external shocks in the form of COVID-related global supply chain disruptions, food and energy crisis following the war in Ukraine, and financial market volatility arising from the aggressive monetary policy tightening have exert, exerted sustained price pressures in the South Asian economies, which is of course felt in other parts of the world also. Now during the first, during the first three quarters of 2022, food price inflation in South Asia averaged more than 20%, and that's pretty high. The region's heavy dependence on imported fossil fuels has made it vulnerable to imported fuel inflation. For successful disinflation, credible monetary policy actions accompanied by targeted supply-side interventions, fiscal trade policy and administrative measures have become the key instruments. While the recent softening of commodity prices and supply chain bottlenecks should help in lowering inflation going ahead, Risks to growth and investment outlook may rise if inflation persists at high levels. Prioritizing price stability may therefore be the optimal policy choice for the, you know, for the South Asian region in the current uh, context. This approach to disinflation, however, needs to be mindful of the rising risks to growth outlook in an environment of deteriorating prospects for global growth and trade activity. The second uh, policy priority that, uh, you know, apart from taming inflation that I would like to highlight is containing external debt vulnerabilities. Now, the surge in external debt in recent years and associated vulnerabilities have undermined macroeconomic stability in several countries in this region. External debt, which was already elevated in low and middle income countries that uh, Sorry, external debt, which was already yeah, which was already elevated in low and middle income countries that include all that includes all the South Asian uh, economies in the pre pandemic period surged to US dollar 9.3 trillion in 2021 from 8.2 trillion in 2019, an increase of 1.1 trillion during these two years from 2019 to 2021. 
The debt service suspension initiative, that is DSSI, was set up by the G20 in May 2020. Up to December 2021, an estimated 12.9 billion US dollar of debt service was deferred. According to World Bank, 60% of the 73 DSSI eligible countries are at high risk of debt distress or are already experiencing it. It is estimated that total external debt service payments on public and publicly guaranteed debt by poorest countries may rise by 35% to about 62 billion US dollar in 2022 and to remain high up to 2024 due to rising global interest rates and the compounding of interest on DSSI debt service deferrals. Even though the participation of private creditors was encouraged in the DSSI, their response has not been encouraging. There has been a notable shift in the creditor composition of low and middle income countries between 2010 and 2021. The share of lending by private creditors in the long term public and publicly guaranteed debt was 61% in 2021. 2021 against 46% in 2010 and the share of debt owed to bondholders was 47% in 2021 against 29% in 2010. A distinct shift in the creditor base over time in favor of private lenders and non-Paris club official creditors has added a new dimension to debt restructuring processes, especially for the low-income IDA-eligible debtor countries. The share of debt owed to non-Paris club creditors rose to 68% in 2021 from 42% in 2010. The increasing reliance on private creditors has raised debt service costs and complicated creditor coordination in debt resolution efforts. During 2010 to 2021, the average maturity on loans from private, credit, from private creditors was 12 years as compared with 26 years for loans from official creditors. And the average interest rate on loans from private creditors was 5% vis-a-vis 2% on loans from official creditors. Now, in this context, the role of multilateral organizations, but I have given too many data. Now, it's, uh, you know, I thought actually for quite a while whether I should have it uh, in a lecture or I should just leave it out. But I thought these are important pieces of numbers, which are important to place things in perspective, which makes us understand the whole, you know, the whole scenario much better. And also uh, can guide us, especially the policymakers, the central banks, and the fiscal authorities, to deal with these uh, debt resolution efforts. A copy of my address will be uploaded in the RBI website soon after this address is over. So those of you who are interested may like to have a look at this, especially with regard to the numbers, if not the content or the arguments, but at least the numbers are important. Now, in this context, the role of multilateral organizations, particularly the IMF and the World Bank, it becomes crucial in making debt treatment efforts more effective, while also strengthening the mechanism of, I repeat, well, while also strengthening the mechanism of recording, reporting, and analysis of debt data so as to enhance transparency and preserve debt sustainability. The IMF's role in capacity building in the region with a focus on region-specific macro-dynamics, policy effectiveness challenges, and economic aspirations of the nations would also be extremely useful. I now move to the third aspect of the third policy priority for the region, and this is in my view. Uh, that is with regard to that is, that focuses on raising productivity while sustained and broad based economic recovery remains the current policy focus it is necessary to undertake deep structural reforms to raise the potential growth trajectories of the economies in the south asian region ongoing global realignment of supply chains green transition and advances in technology offer new opportunities for investment and growth. 
but policies would need to create the congenial climate for attracting new private investment with public sector taking the lead in areas that can create positive externalities such as infrastructure, health and education. In this context, let me highlight, particularly in the context of raising productivity and what I have just said, in this context, let me highlight some specific areas of policy priority. First, undertaking desirable structural change would require an improvement in resource allocation, moving production from low productive sectors to high productive sectors and promotion of innovation. Second, skill mismatches which is a major constraint to resource reallocation, would warrant policy focus on education and skill upgradation. This is particularly important to the South Asian region as the favorable demography of the region would require that production processes must be labor intensive while also being globally competitive. Third, while free trade and FDI have been conventionally congenial for diffusion of technology and augmentation of productivity, the region's investment on research and development must also increase from the current low levels and the policy environment for scientific research and startups must be made more rewarding. Fourth, investment in physical infrastructure consisting of energy, transportation and telecommunication which are prime drivers of productivity growth also have to be enhanced. Infrastructure in the contemporary world of digital revolution would also include digital infrastructure, that is data centers, cellular towers and fiber connectivity with an emphasis on scalability and resilience. FinTech, e-commerce, edtech, health tech and food tech are the new age growth propellers and need to equally and need quality internet connectivity and reliable digital payment systems. I now turn to the fourth area of policy priority and that is strengthening cooperation for energy security. The South Asian region has a high reliance on fossil fuels and imported energy, making the region vulnerable to volatile oil, gas and coal prices. In view of the dominating influence of geopolitical factors in driving global energy market dynamics. The region needs to strengthen energy cooperation arrangements so as to enhance resilience to external shocks. India and Bangladesh have already agreed to enhance the sub-regional connectivity in the energy sector by linking the power grids of the two countries synchronously. The India-Bangladesh friendship pipeline project which is a 130 kilometer pipeline joining Siliguri in West Bengal and Parvatipur in Bangladesh would have a capacity to export petroleum products of 1 million metric tons per annum. Other examples of cooperation include transportation of petroleum, oil and lubricants across national jurisdictions. Similarly, cross-border petroleum product pipeline and joint venture hydroelectric electric projects are testimony to the immense scope for energy cooperation in the South Asian region. Harmonization of testing processes, performance and conservation standards, and leveling criteria for electrical appliances in the region can contribute to regional energy security by promoting cost savings and by boosting efficiency and trade. Integration of national power systems in the region could facilitate leveraging of untapped surplus hydropower while also giving Philip to development of solar and wind resources. Programs of bulk procurement and distribution of energy efficient appliances can be adopted by can be adopted by countries in the region. India, for example, has the Ujala scheme for distribution of LED bulbs at an affordable price. The next area, which is I think the fifth area of policy priority is cooperation for greener economy in the region. South Asia is one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change because of its large population and degradation of natural resources. Extreme climate events, that is floods, droughts, heat waves and unseasonal rains have increased over the past century 
as per estimates of the International Financial Corporation, IFC, between 2018 and 2030, the funding requirements for investment in renewable energy, greening the vehicle fleet and making future building stock green and resilient to climate change risks in South Asia alone would, would be over US dollar 410 billion, 670 billion and 1.3 trillion respectively. I mean, I mentioned the three components and uh, these are the investments required in the three components and the three components are funding requirements for investment in renewable energy one greening the vehicle fleet and uh, that is number two and making future building stock green and resilient to climate change this is the third component and the funding requirements have been mentioned besides financing access to technology and key minerals would also be critical for successful green transition Robust regional disaster management systems could help in ensuring timely and effective response to devastating climate events. India spearheaded the global initiative and launched a Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI, in 2019. Another initiative, the International Solar Alliance, in partnership with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, aims at solarizing the world. The South Asian regions must strengthen cooperation to make green transition in the region faster and at reasonable cost. And finally, the sixth uh, area of policy priority for this region, I feel, should be promotion of tourism, which has immense potential in this region. Now, tourism is one of the major contributors to the GDP of some of the South Asian nations, such, such as Maldives, Nepal, Bhutan and Sri Lanka. As a sector, tourism, as all of us know, is a huge creator of employment. The entire region has rich, untapped potential in tourism. In recent period, the tourism sector has somewhat revived in the region, but is yet to reach the pre-pandemic levels, that is the pre-COVID levels. Intra-regional tourist flows also remain below potential. It has revived, but I think it has a way to go. Regional initiatives such as religious tourism circuits spanning countries that have common historical and cultural footprint, adventure tourism circuits, and medical, spiritual, or Ayurveda circuits can help boost tourism in tourism industry and create a, viber, a vibrant regional value chain. Let me now try and conclude. With the global trade outlook for 2023 overcast, Greater intra-regional trade in the South Asian region can enhance opportunities for growth and employment in this region. At the central bank level, a key dimension for cooperation in the region has been learning from each other on common goals and challenges, such as infrastructure financing, digital financial inclusion, reducing the cost of cross-border remittances by linking with the UPI system, and unconventional monetary policy, to name a few. Rupee settlement of cross-border trade and central bank digital currency, where the Reserve Bank of India has already started moving forward, can also be areas of greater cooperation in the future. Finally, let me just say that the book to be released today provides plenty of new ideas for forging cooperation in the region and seeking solutions to common problems through right policy interventions. I appreciate the efforts of the authors whose contributions have made this book possible. I do believe that the discussions during the day on policy choices will help us in reshaping the future prospects of the South Asian region. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your hearing.